Hello, this is Robert Rickover at Body Learning, and today my guest is Joanne Widner, who is an Alexander Technique teacher in Richmond, Virginia. She has a, a long-standing uh, uh, personal and professional interest in health. She has a uh, she has a nursing degree, a master of science in exercise in uh, exercise and physiology. And she also um, has a great interest in horses. And we're going to talk today uh, on the topic, uh, Horses as Teachers of the Alexander Technique. Uh, Joanne, welcome to the show. Thanks, Robert. It's good to be here. Well, it's good to talk to you again. We've actually had a few earlier, uh, done a few earlier interviews. Um, Joanne, I wonder if you could begin by giving our listeners a very short description or definition of the uh, Alexander Technique? Okay, well, I can give you a, a very short one, mm -hmm. and that is that the Alexander Technique is how to do anything better. Yep, that's that. Uh, that's a that's definitely a, a good one. It's a, it's. Would, a would you like a little more? If 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 you want, sure. Yeah. Alexander technique is, has been around for over 100 years now, I believe, mm -hmm. and uh, it was developed by F. M. Alexander, who was a horseman, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. But the way he developed his technique was actually to improve his speaking ability as a. Uh, stage performer. Mm -hmm. um, but he worked with himself and his manner of use, which is something we'll talk about as we talk about horses, and uh, developed a system that improved his balance, his coordination, his speaking ability, and his breathing. And we can use that today uh, to improve no matter what we're doing, whether it's washing some dishes or sitting at our computer or doing something very sophisticated such as playing a musical instrument or riding a horse. Right, and it's something that's used a lot by people in the performing arts who, uh, who want to improve the quality of their performance skills, and it also has a pretty big following among people who've had back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, that kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So it has a wide application. Now, um, this whole question of... Um, Alex, uh, horses, as Alexander Technique teachers, came out of a blog that I wrote uh, some time ago. Um, on the, on I was sort of musing on the topic um, of giving lessons to animals, such as horses, and also what are the possibilities of getting an Alexander-ish lesson from an animal. And you wrote a really nice response to that um, to that blog that uh, informed me of something that I had never heard about before, which are horses who are uh, highly trained and who have usually retired from competition, but who serve a function of actually training riders, and they're called schoolmasters. I had never heard that term before. Uh -huh. And, and we'll, we will probably get to that more later. But um, you also, uh, I, I believe, wanted to talk about s uh, simply observing horses as a way of getting, of learning about coordination and balance. Do you want to talk a little bit about that first? Sure, sure. I think it's a nice lead in. Um, if you've ever had a chance to observe horses and, uh, you know, you don't actually have to have a live horse in front of you. If you live in a city, you may not see too many unless it's a carriage horse, but you certainly can go to YouTube and, and find lots of videos and, and observe how horses move. But it's just um, makes principles of movement that if you're, you're taking Alexander Technique lessons and your your teacher is saying, uh, we want your head in balance, your head needs to always lead your body, sometimes that's a little hard to understand because we live our lives in the vertical. But if, if you look at a horse who is living their life in the horizontal plane, it becomes crystal clear how important their head is to their overall balance and how the head always leads the body. Any change in direction will be preceded with a, a change in the direction of, of the head. 
Mm -hmm. And of course, Alexander teachers also talk a lot about uh, our necks, that region between our heads and our torsos. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, horses have a very large necks that extend out from their torso. And Alexander teachers like to talk about the importance of a free neck, a neck that's easily adaptable to changing circumstances. And I know that people who are skilled riders will, will, uh, in terms of directing a horse, say the direction the horse is going to go using the reins or using other signals, are are always very careful not to interfere with the horse's neck's natural freedom. And that sort of fits in with with uh, Alexander ideas as well. Right, right. Um, the, the horse's, the structure of the horse's head and neck is, is similar yet slightly different to what we see in the human being in that the horse's head obviously has a very different shape, but they still have the same atlanto-occipital joint mm -hmm. that uh, Alexander teachers pay a great deal of attention to. And the rider will want their horse to be free in their AO joint. In fact, they call it the horse's pole, P-O-L-L. -L. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a little bit different relationship in that the head is hanging uh, forward and down a bit from that atlas, whereas in the human being, our skull is sitting right up on top of that atlas. Mm -hmm. But we still want freedom in that joint. And um, if a horse becomes startled or they become tense, they will do the same thing that a human being will do when they become startled and tense, and that is to contract the muscles in the back of the neck, or in the horse it would be the top of the neck. Mm -hmm. And their nose will poke out and their their head will come up, and you know that's that's fine for a horse to do if they're just standing and they're not carrying a human being on their back. But if they do that when they're carrying a rider, then their whole coordination and balance goes off kilter. And so um, horses will sometimes do that when they are learning to carry a rider, or if they're resisting the actions of the reins. And uh, that's considered a, a big flaw if you see a, a horse do that. We want them to be um, fluid and easy and relaxed in the neck and balancing themselves by uh, being free in their head and neck and using the balance of their neck and the, and the suspension of their um, head to raise their back and bring them into what's called engagement. Mm -hmm. And it, do you think that um, you mentioned... Someone who's not around actual horses could certainly watch videos of, of horses moving very well on YouTube. Um, do you think that simply watching that and maybe paying a bit of attention to the head-neck relationship of the horse horse that you're watching, that that in itself has some carryover into your own use of your own neck? You know, that's kind of a hard question for me to answer because I've been around horses since I was a tiny tot. <laughs> so, and, the, and actually learned the Alexander technique kind of late in life. So I was very familiar with horses and, and how they balanced and how they moved. And it was such a delight to discover that my own body operated <laughs> according to the same principles. Right. So it's a little bit hard for me to answer, but it seems to me, yes, they would, because it's on such a big scale. You know, the horse has that nice long neck, and, uh, you know, when they raise their head, it's so obvious if they do it by contracting the muscles along their top line, because their nose will poke out. Mm -hmm. um, but if they're carrying themselves in a nice and balanced way, the, the head will drop down, and the, the face of the horse uh, will be perhaps slightly in front of the vertical or uh, vertical or perpendicular to the ground. Mm -hmm. um, it, if it comes behind it, then they're um, tucking their nose back too far and, and they lose that uh, dynamic tone. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you can kind of see all those things and you can watch it in a horse that's just moving around freely. Mm -hmm. um, what's really interesting is, is to watch a, a stallion who is trying to impress a band of mares mm -hmm. because they, they do kind of 
puff up and they carry themselves with this lightness and this flashiness that's, of course, gorgeous to watch. Mm -hmm. And I suppose another advantage of watching horses uh, with a video, uh, videos of horses, is you can slow it down and see the movements in slow motion. Mm-hmm. And um, again, and you Im- play it, yeah, and, and catch it again. Right, and <laughs> just seeing how how a change in that head neck relationship of a horse, which I would imagine for for, for beginning Alexander students might be easier to see and identify than it might be to to see that on a human being. Mm-hmm. So there is that advantage. I think so. I I know it certainly is for me, but then again, I I know I've got this long background with horses Mm -hmm. that maybe, you know, someone else would not have. And so it it might not be as easy for them to see, but I would think they could see it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in in the... um... In the original article that I, the blog I wrote, I did quote a teacher who also had been around horses from an early age, an Alexander teacher who said that when she was a young girl, if she felt stressed or out of sorts, she would get on her horse and sort of uh, lie over the horse's back Mm -hmm. and just absorb the... um, well, you could call it your Alexander directions, or you know, just absorb the uh, the energies really of the horse. And she would find that she would it would take away a lot of the physical tension that she had built up. So that that's uh, was that's as far as I got in terms of eliciting a response about how to get a lesson from a horse until. You wrote in your reply about these um, horses called schoolmasters. Um, c- could you say a little bit about this tradition and and how it works in the horse riding community? Mm-hmm. It's um, I'm mostly familiar with the concept um, through the practice of dressage, which is the the classical horsemanship that began back in the renaissance and and probably if you you really want to get a picture of pure dressage go on youtube and look at the pictures of the the white stallions of vienna the spanish riding school mm-hmm. um and their system is um is very much the schoolmaster um system where the young riders are paired with the old horses and uh, the old horses who have been doing dressage for years and years and years, and the riders learn from the horse uh, because, and of course, they have their human riding instructor there coaching them. But uh, when you get on a, a horse for the first time, uh, something that's really quite interesting and, and perhaps startling is there's this moving creature underneath your sit bones. Mm-hmm. And it is very different than sitting in a chair, mm-hmm. which is a stable flat Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. And uh, particularly if you uh, are able to sit in a saddle or perhaps just a um, saddle pad, so you not don't even have anything firm, just the horse's back beneath your sit bones, and you get you you really understand how those sit bones move independently. And that it's not just, you know, mm-hmm, a flat, mm-hmm. <laughs> uniform support. And that's just sitting. Um, once the horse goes into movement, then you feel this, this you know, kind of back and forth. And um, something that's um, interesting is, aside from this long tradition of dressage, uh, horses are used in therapeutic riding programs uh, for children with developmental delays or walking difficulties or even adults who have had injuries, such as a head injury or a stroke or uh, war injuries. And the, when, the horse, when, when the human being sits on the horse and their pelvis is in contact with the horse's back and the horse begins to walk, the horse's back actually moves the human's or the rider's pelvis in the same motion that our pelvis makes when we are walking. And so it can actually help someone gain the ability or regain the ability to walk mm-hmm. through that 
stimulation of the nervous system and the strengthening of the muscles that will occur with that movement. Well, that's it. That's an interesting point. So the, these um, these schoolmaster horses are are um, I gather trained to um, put up with bad riding, but not let the bad riding influence them in a bad way. Would that be a fair way to say it? Well, I think there there's a different. You know, there's this whole little nomenclature. Uh, if you first start riding, you're not going to get put on a schoolmaster. Uh-huh. A schoolmaster is for a rider who's who's been riding a while, and they're really starting to understand the finer points of riding. Mm-hmm. If you go out to a stable and you want to learn to ride, you're going to put be put on this saint of a horse, simply called a school horse. Mm-hmm. And they are horses who, they know their job, they probably listen to the riding instructor much more than they listen to you as the riding student, even though you're up on their back. Mm -hmm. And they know the drill and they know the routine. And you can learn. You can learn your balance. You can learn your cues. And if you don't do it right, um, the horse is probably going to pretty much ignore that, which is kind of they've learned inhibition to Mm -hmm. a certain extent. Um, but they'll, if you're in the ballpark, you know, if you're somewhat close, they'll go ahead and give it to you. Mm-hmm. And so you can learn the basics. And then as you get better, you get put on a horse that's a little bit more sensitive and is going to be listening to you more and to the instructor less. And you've got to be a little bit more accurate. And if you aren't, uh, you know, if you give them conflicting signals, they might get a little irritated with you because mm-hmm. they're listening enough that they're w- wanting that right cue, but you're not giving it. So they they might, you know, switch their tail a little bit and say, that's not right. Try again. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when you do put your cues together properly, then they will reward you with the correct movement. Mm-hmm. And so as you progress up the le- levels of riding, um, once you are quite good, actually, that's the level where you're going to get to ride a schoolmaster. And these are horses with just superb balance. And they're just uh, they're just magical to ride. They're so much fun. Um, and they're horses that we say have a lot of buttons. <laughs> so mm-hmm. you, you can create all kinds of fun movements with them, um, changes of tempo, um, uh, intricate movements. Um, they learn what are called the high school movements of riding, which is like the trot in place, which is the pee off, mm-hmm. uh, which just feels like the horse is dancing. Um, but, you know, you, you've got to be good before you're going to get a chance to ride a horse like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's, and, it's a wonderful and, experience. And you, you, you write that through years of training, uh, schoolmasters are very correct in their use while carrying a rider and improve the rider's use in much the same way that the touch of an Alexander uh, teacher does. That's which right. is a fascinating idea, um, that they are, um, they, they, know, they know what good riding's all about, and they also are very sensitive to how you might deviate from that and is it that they gently correct you somehow or how how does that work it depends on the disposition of the horse you uh-huh. know it, it's kind of like you know teachers human teachers have different dispositions some are very exacting and if you don't do it right you're going to get kind of a withering look and <laughs> Right. Whereas another teacher might be very patient and say, well, you're kind of on the right track, but if you want to do it more like this, uh, it really depends on, on the horse. Um, but the, the very best are, are patient. They're, they're tolerant enough that they're going to tolerate your mistakes, um, but they aren't really going to do what you're asking until you ask correctly. Um, I have a, a friend who... Uh, has a a, a lovely horse that uh, she had to take a break from riding because she was pregnant. And the horse uh, was ridden by her trainer. So when she got back to riding after she had given birth, the horse at that point knew more than she did 
Mm-hmm. And so she was trying to learn what's called the flying change of lead in the canter. Um, canter's a three-beat gait. And um, when a horse is circling to the right, they lead with the right. And when they're circling to the left, they lead with the left. But a horse will do what's called a flying change. And it, it really feels like a little dance when they do that. And she was trying to cue her horse for this. And he he granted her the flying change. But he literally kind of dumped her from one sit bone to the other when he gave the change. So he gave a very exaggerated change. So she could feel... The result was she could feel from with her pelvis what she needed to do with her pelvis in order to cue this movement. And so he was very generous with her. It was a very interesting story, it, it, you know, just dumping her on her opposite sit bone until she could feel it. But then he wouldn't do it unless she did it correctly and cued him correctly with her sit bones. So she, the horse gave her uh, a lesson, but then... Uh, then it was up to her to implement that lesson. Right, exactly. That's, that's amazing, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, the whole issue or the whole question of the connection between a rider and their horse is so interesting because it's an incredibly intimate physical re- relationship and m- movements of one directly uh, are picked up by the other and... Um, it, it's it's kind of um, a non a fascinating nonverbal exchange of I don't know what you would call it of beings almost mm-hmm. of communication communication yeah nonverbal communication and as of course you said it uh, horse uh, horses are used in in a therapeutic setting I know here in in Lincoln there are a couple of programs on that and I actually taught one uh, once at a place like that outside of Toronto. So, I mean, horses can be therapeutic, but they can also, uh, I guess being a teacher is a little different from being par- therapeutic, but they can perform that role as well. Mm-hmm. It's it's a fascinating thing. Um, is there anything else that you'd want to talk, talk about in connection with this, uh, this whole question of learning from horses? Uh, I think we've pretty much covered it. Um, I, I just would encourage anyone, if you haven't ever ridden a horse, to uh, look for a riding school with a with a good reputation and a well run program and very suitable horses. Mm-hmm. And and it, particularly if you are an Alexander teacher or you're interested in an Alexander technique, you know you'll just find the parallels incredibly fascinating. And it's it's also a real good way to test your use. You know, Mm -hmm. if you're feeling like, yeah, I really got this head, neck, back relationship stuff sorted out. I got Mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. You know, well, you want to take it to the next level. Go hop on a horse and carry Mm -hmm. out your head, neck, back relationship. (laughs) And you'll get you'll get instant feedback. (laughs) You will You'll get instant feedback. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's an accident that Alexander himself was very interested in horses and observing them. Riding them, betting on them. I mean, he was he was a very horse oriented guy, as I I guess a lot of Australians at that time and and even today are. And um, even terms uh, terms uh, in the Alexander world like use, uh, I be- which sort of means how you organize yourself to do activities. I believe that term comes from the language of horse trainers in Australia in the 19th century. That that is a horse term. It, yeah. it is a horse how, term. How the horse uses himself. We talk about horses oh, with okay. good use. So it's still used today. Mm-hmm. That term. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, that's exactly what Alexander teachers talk about about people. Uh, mm-hmm. Are they using themselves well or not so well? So um, th- there is this kind of connection between the Alexander technique and, and horses and horseback riding that goes back a, a long ways. So maybe this would be a good point to bring our conversation to an end. Um, my my guest today has been Joanne Widner, who's an Alexander Technique teacher in Richmond, Virginia. If uh, anything that we've talked about intrigues you and you live in the Richmond area, we'll put a link to her website by the interview. 
And uh, we'll also put a link to a site where you can locate a teacher uh, anywhere in the world and learn more about the Alexander Technique. Uh, jo Joanne, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, thank you, Robert. I enjoyed it.